here. All right, so just like I outlined yesterday, we're gonna have the first 10 minutes of the, the call for any kind of questions that people have. Um, and then we will be doing our first talkie day. Uh, these are days that start with T where we're gonna have someone from industry um, come in and talk to you about their experiences. Um, today we have someone I'm pretty excited to introduce you to. Um, and so we'll be doing that in about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna start answering some questions. Uh, first question from Alexis. Hello, Alexis, good to see you again. Uh, where can I find yesterday's recording? So yesterday's recording was linked out in an email that I sent out about an hour after the course ended last night. Um, it is on YouTube and I can actually, I'll drop a link right here in a minute. Um, I'm gonna put them on YouTube and I will link them out uh, after every class. So let me just drop this in here. That should be the link. Okay, the next question is for anonymous. It's, do you need to commit when using code spaces? And if so, does the code space require you to wait for the files um, to sync or, or so? Yeah, so uh, you do have to commit when using code spaces. That's gonna be one of the first things that I covered today so that, um, Obviously yesterday when you all just wrote like puts hello and that was the only code you had, it's not super important for us to sync that back to the repository. But when we start writing more advanced code or code that we will build on over time, we're gonna want to start syncing it back. Um, also it's important that we, sync, that we learn how to sync it because if someone's having a problem, uh, I wanna make sure that they're able to, um, to share the code that they're working on with, the, with myself and the TAs. So I will show you how to do that at the beginning of the class. The next question is, can you go through code space and repository? Um, I'll try to do this when I am, um, I probably won't be able to go through repository, but I will show you uh, the code space thing again briefly um, when I'm showing you how to, how to commit and push your code. Next question is, can you let people know to send their chats to panelists and attendees? Yeah, so if you, there are a lot of people that are writing in the general chat. Uh, that you're sending a message, but it's only in Zoom. I mean, you're sending a message and it's only coming to me, uh, which is not great because you might be saying something that everyone wants to see. So if you just switch the little um, drop down to panelists and attendees, that should fix it for you. Um, I don't think I have a setting to make it the default the other way around, but if there is, I will make sure to do it for tomorrow. Next question is, do you know why I can't run the extension? Um, I've tried to reinstall. Yeah, I can't think of any reason. The extension is is pretty basic. Um, I would, um, if it's helpful, maybe you can email me some screenshots of what it looks like when you right click on a file so that I can see what it looks like. Uh, the next question is besides commit, is it necessary to hit save? It is not necessary to hit save, um, but it is necessary to push, which I'll go over again in a minute. When I, when I show you how to do that. The next question is, do I revamp CVs or resumes or do I know anyone that would be able to bring it to life? Um, I don't do that. I, I mean, I have the same problem. <laughs> it's like, it's hard to write a compelling resume that's gonna stand out from other ones. I can give you a couple tips because I do spend a lot of time um, reviewing resumes. So the first thing I'll say is that um, my eye is normally caught by like a, a cover letter that is written for the position. So not just a cover letter. Um, I think a lot of people tend to make a cover letter and then reuse that cover letter over and over again. Um, I think you'll have better luck if you write a cover letter that actually talks about the position that you're applying to and how your experience directly correlates to that. The next thing is to make sure that on your resume, you have like an experience area and probably separate of the experience area, we really like to see a list of skills. So um, I don't, if I have to, uh, it's gonna sound a little crazy, but I don't wanna have to read the entire resume word for word to find out what you're, what you're good at. So make sure that there's a list of skills at the top that's kind of like your, your advertisement. And then you can go into more detail about what you've done with those skills later down. 
Next question is, does the committed code slash Ruby file reside in the readme, uh, under the readme? Um, it depends what it's named, because I think the files are ordered um, by name. So the readme will normally end up first, I think, because it's capitalized, but I could be totally wrong about that. It's just, um, you, you can, it would, it would end up in that list, but I don't know what order they would be in. Uh, the next question is, I hope the course would be as basic as much as possible. Uh, I'm going to try to make it basic, or at least, um, I guess I should say that a little differently. I'm not going to try to make it basic, but I am going to try to make it so that if you imagine like the ramp um, that will get you from wherever you are now to knowing what to do, um, I want that ramp to start at zero. Um, that doesn't mean that the ramp's not going to be very steep though. Meaning like, um, I think in a lot of courses that might take 10 weeks or 20 weeks, they can have a more gentle ramp and give you more time to in class to learn all the things. The ramp here is going to be like that. Um, we're going to cover some stuff today, for example, that I think in a conventional Ruby course would take like a week easily. Uh, where can you find your GitHub handle is the next question. Uh, if you click on the little avatar in the top right hand corner when you sign into GitHub, um, actually, let me verify that what I'm saying is true before I tell you that, uh, but it should be in there. Um, let's click it. Yep, it's right at the top. It says signed in as and then your handle. The next question is, thank you for the YouTube upload after yesterday's class. The image slash font was too small to see what you're typing. FYI, you could either make it larger or call out what you're typing. I will try to do that. I'm guessing you're talking about the screen share part. Um, I will try to make everything bigger so that the recording is more visible in the future. Uh, and if you're talking about the slides, you don't have to worry because I'm not going to be showing any slides practically at all for the entire rest of the course. Uh, and the last question, also from an anonymous attendee, is could you show us how to navigate to questions on the GitHub repo? Um, I, I can show you that. I might save that for the end of the course, but I can tell you briefly how to get there. Um, you're going to want to search for the repository using the search functionality on our organization page, the repository called questions. Click into that, and then there's a, there's a link at the top that says discussions. That's how you'll um, be able to answer a question. Or sorry, ask a question. How do you push from code spaces? I will show you in a minute how to do that. And can I repeat how to get the lectures on YouTube? Uh, just look out for an email that I sent about an hour after yesterday's class that says first session complete, I think. I think that was a subject. And if not, then something like that and you'll find it. Okay, and with that, I am going to take a second here to figure out how to use Zoom. Okay. I we're still waiting. I think for our um, our second panelist. So what I'm going to do while we're waiting, I think they're planning on showing up around five fifteen. Uh, I'm going to continue to answer the questions that are here, and then we'll welcome um, the other person. So. Uh, FYI, I just tested command plus to increase the font size. Yeah, that's what I did yesterday. I did like a couple bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, I can try to do more. The, the problem is like, because there's the thing on the bottom and the thing on the left, the more bigger, bigger, bigger you go, the less area you have to write code. But I will try to balance those two things. Next question is programming is going to be done in code space throughout this program. Are we going to have trouble when we use a local machine and not use code space? Um, I don't think so because the course is about is about programming. So we're going to teach you programming in the course, and then um, you know spending time and doing that environment setup should be fairly easy. Uh, I can also link you to some articles later about setting up um, setting up Ruby and Rails on your local machine. Actually, if you have Mac OS, you already have Ruby installed. So um, I don't think it will be that hard, but I'm open to being wrong about that. But what I'm not open to be wrong about is the fact that if I give you all your own environments, that it's going to be really confusing to determine whether or not you're having trouble because of something on your end or something on like how you're approaching the problem. So I want to, as much as we can, take all of the environments and normalize them. 
Uh, how do you ask questions to the TAs? Uh, just use the questions repository. Um, there's also a really helpful Slack uh, community that's that's formed. It was very nice to, to see. So if you have questions, you can also ask them over there. Uh, notice that the code spaces tab becomes suspended after a period of inactivity. Uh, yep, that is true. It's going to take time to restore it back. The reason is that um, these are these are like virtual computers in the sky, right? So um, they're out there in the world, and it's very expensive to keep those virtual computers on. So when they are not being actively used, they get turned off and they turn back on. It shouldn't take more than a minute to have it back, though. Uh, if you didn't receive an email after the class um, and the YouTube channel doesn't have videos, that's true. The YouTube channel does not have videos because the videos are not listed. You'll need a direct link to the video. Um, I put it in the chat here. I'm sure it's in Slack as well. And if you didn't get the email, I would say check your spam or promotions folder because um, they all went out. If you still don't have the email, please email me and I'll make sure that you're on the distribution list and make sure that the emails got sent to you. Um, is metaprogramming important in Ruby? That seems like a kind of an in the weeds question. I'm gonna choose not to answer it uh, because I don't wanna confuse people with what metaprogramming is. Um, how do we get added to the Slack? Uh, there's a link in the email. Alexis, the same email that you just found, there's a link inside of there. And if I'm searching for the questions repo and it's not coming up, then you might not be on the team, which is called all participants. And what you can do to fix that is you can click request to join. And then after the class, I will, I will find you. Um, I will find you your request and I will grant the request and you'll be on the team and everything will be fine. Oof. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think moving to Slack for things is, is fine. Um, what I am a little worried about is I uh, don't have the bandwidth to watch Slack and Zoom and everything. So if you have a particular question for me, um, I, I would hope that we can keep those questions in um, in Zoom, just because that's where I'll see them. And yeah, you can use you can use Slack after the class. That's definitely true, and everyone should should um, should join Slack. And I'm not trying to discount what you're saying about joining Slack. I'm just saying if you have a question for me, and you want me to see what you're saying, um, I just like it's too much to do at once. Um. Okay. We are waiting still on our panelists, though it should be here any second. Um, and I've actually got a couple a couple panelists laid out for the future as well. So uh, after 10,000 posts, stuff disappears from Slack. Um, yes. Sarah, if you message me, I know Erica asked that question, but Sarah is the admin of the Slack workspace. I'm happy to pay for, for more messages if we want a higher retention period. Um, we can we can figure that out. I'd hate for like for us to lose content um, that might be helpful to people. Okay, so Mary. Okay, so it is five fifteen. Mary is going to join in just a moment, but in the meantime, I'm going to spend some time talking about who Mary is and uh, who she is to me and how um, how great she is. And then she's gonna show up and everything's gonna, the timing's gonna work perfectly. It's gonna be great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And I hope I, I'm, I hope I'm saying you're just like everyone, when I say your name, if I say it incorrectly, I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, I mean, no disrespect. I, it's just a lot of names. Um, just like Sarah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so Mary is a director of engineering at GitHub. She um, has a background in infrastructure. So when we say infrastructure in our, um, in our profession, we basically mean managing all of the computer systems that 
um, that our software runs on. So when we're writing Ruby code or we're writing architecture code, we actually depend on another set of people that keep the systems all working correctly and keep everything, keep everything moving as appropriate. Um, so Mary has a background in infrastructure, um, but is currently, like I said, a director of engineering at GitHub, um, where she um, spends a lot of, you know, you can't talk yet, Mary. I'm gonna make you be able to talk. Um, she spends a lot of time working with some of our ERGs, in particular, a group called the ADACATS, which I'm sure she's gonna talk about here. Um, so just everyone in the chat, Mary, there's uh, 185 people watching. It's amazing to have you here and thank you so much for, um, for participating and, and being willing to talk to us for a bit. Mary's gonna talk for about 10 minutes and then um, is gonna be taking some questions. Hey everyone, um, John. If you want me to be able to turn on my video, I, you have to like I guess give me magic powers for it. What? Um, <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to to hang out with me today um, and talk about about you know what it's like to work in software and and what I've been up to in uh, in my life. Mary, I'm, um, gonna, I'm gonna sorry to interrupt you. I'm gonna convert yeah. you to the meeting host, maybe. Uh oh, let's see then, what happens. And then maybe you'll give control back. Otherwise, Mary's gonna leave the course from now on. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Did it work? It worked. It worked. Okay, I will I promise I'll give you control back um, in the future. Uh cool. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for taking time to uh, chat with me and hear about me today. Um, definitely would love to hear uh, would love to hear any questions you have, but I'll sort of start off first on on um, on a little bit about me. So as John uh, mentioned, I uh, before well a couple companies ago, I I spent most of my time doing infrastructure work or technical operations work or DevOps work, depending on which your favorite term is for that. Um, but I actually started out my career as a chemical engineer. Um, I went to an engineering school, got my engineering degree. You had to learn to code to be, well, you still have to learn to code to be an, to an, and be an engineer of any kind. Um, and I ended up uh, moving out of traditional engineering. Um, I know that I know that tech gets a bad rap for, for diversity and inclusion, but to be honest, um, Traditional engineering fields are, are worse than software engineering, uh, and I'm happy to at some point talk about anything more about that. But um, but uh, anyway, so so I liked uh, software engineering better. It was faster paced, and it was actually a better uh, atmosphere for for more diverse folks anyway. Um, and so I moved over into software engineering, and I actually started out my first role in a software company was as a project manager um, because it was really hard to pivot from. Uh, one engineering uh, job to another engineering job without already having that software engineering um, experience. Um, and then, uh, so started out as a project manager actually, and then was able to do more technical work um, on the side in addition to my project management. And that was sort of how I moved up in the ranks of, of being able to do engineering work. Um, and then I think, uh, send, uh, I so I worked for a company called CPM Health Grades, which did like marketing for hospitals. Um, and uh, then I moved over to a company called SendGrid, also as a started out as a project manager there, but um, quickly became a sort of pr productive member of our DevOps team, um, which we called technical operations at the time. Uh, SendGrid actually did and still does, although they're owned by Twilio now. Um, have their own infrastructure in addition to being an AWS. So uh, a lot of the work I did was around uh, network design, um, data centers, how to like ordering hardware for data centers, getting networks set up, uh, making sure we're ordering the right server hardware, um, and then migrating data centers. Um, and then that moved morphed into more like um, architecture work around how do we architect systems with resilient data stores, um, designing processes, designing ways to migrate some of our workloads from data centers to AWS. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, I love talking DevOps with people because there's always really great war stories to talk about. Um, but uh, wanted to, I knew that I wanted to be more in a leadership role. And so uh, I started uh, managing our operations department and then uh, realized that I wanted to um, have more of a role in leading engineering as a whole, not just uh, DevOps. And also I wanted to get more empathy for the software engineering, the like 
product engineering might be another way to say it side of things. And so I moved over at SendGrid to manage some of our software engineering teams, our billing team, our anti-abuse team, and our sign-up team. Uh, and then um, I've been working at SendGrid for a long time, and I sort of got uh, burned out. Um, we had, we when I started, the company was 70 people, uh, 50 or 70. And then by the time I left, we were over 500. So we'd grown really quickly, and we'd sort of cycled out our whole management team. And I wanted to, I was looking for a bit of a change to something with the a little bit more of a startup feel. So I started, I uh, moved to a company called uh, Electric Coin Company, which works on a cryptocurrency it's called Zcash. They're a cryptocurrency startup. And I ran the engineering group there for a while. And that was fun. Um, my linear algebra skills from college definitely came in handy there. Um, and then I had a, a coworker of mine who I'd worked with at SendGrid, uh, who worked at, who was a VP of engineering at GitHub and said, hey, like GitHub's hiring. Do you want to be a director of engineering here? Um, and GitHub has always been a place that I wanted to work. Um, and so definitely was excited to, to make the jump there. Um, and yeah, now I uh, am a director of engineering at GitHub. Uh, I've worked on a, a few different products at GitHub. Um, I've worked on uh, GitHub education, GitHub sponsors. Yeah, yep, you all know Zuko. Some of you know Zuko, how about that? Um, uh, GitHub sponsors, um, what else? What else has I worked on? Uh, oh yeah, GitHub discussions, some of the more community. Sorry, someone just said, oh, you know Zuko. Zuko was the uh, CEO at uh, Electric Coin Company. He's sort of like famous in the crypto circles. Um, I am not famous in the crypto circles and would like to remain that way. <laughs> not famous in those circles. Um, anyway, sorry. So now I work on GitHub billing. Uh, and then, oh yeah, how management, what management is like and how to create room for underrepresented people. Um, what management is like. Uh, I feel like lots of different people have different experiences of what management is like, depending on their management style. Um, but I would say that management is all about just um, getting everyone moving in the right direction and making sure that everyone is growing, fulfilled, having a good time um, as much as possible. As well as um, as a manager, your job is to protect your team and try to create like a nice a nice environment for them um, so that they can do the work that they need to do. Um, but it also involves building trust with your team so that you can break bad news to them. Um, I am a very direct person. Um, and so I'm very direct about like breaking bad news to people. And it's important that you can build that trust with folks so that you can have the hard conversations about like, I know that you really wanted to work on this thing that was causing pain for the team, but unfortunately the company has this really important strategic priority and this is why it's important. So it's a lot of like translating, trying to create the best environment possible and then trying to help message uh, decisions to your team at the director level. At the, at the head of engineering level, yeah, it's, it's pretty similar, but you, you're making more of the decisions rather than doing the messaging. Um, and then uh, lastly, just a little bit on my work on how to create in, uh, inclusive teams or create room from underrepresented groups. Um, as a, as a uh, woman in tech, I have some insight into what it's like to be an underrepresented uh, person in tech, but I'm still very white. Um, and so I think that one of the biggest things to do uh, to create room is to educate yourself on what it's like to be not who you are. Um, in tech, uh, get friends from other places, read literature, um, sort of learn about what, what other folks' experiences are like. Um, and then also, uh, I found that one of, the, one of the most important things I've had to learn is try to figure out how to build a ton of political capital so that I can know, th go then spend it on diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, like uh, it, at GitHub, uh, as part of the Ada Cats, we, I uh, started a mentorship program. Um, for folks to uh, connect underrepresented folks in GitHub to um, mentors that are willing to help them out, um, provide coaching and guidance and sponsorship. Um, also done some like professional development workshops for folks that like want more information about sort of what, how to in increase in their career at GitHub. Um, I'll stop there because there's a ton of little stuff to go into and I don't want to take up the whole time with, with this. But um, yeah, I'd love to take any questions. I think I already see one in the chat, but there's also a Q&A tab. Let me see what we got. Um, <laughs> cool. All right, so we've got, interesting. 
What is the expectation, John, uh, please feel free to tell me if I'm reading the wrong questions. Um, what is the expectation for product management professionals in tech with coding efficiency and complexity? Um, so as a product manager, you're most of the time not expected to do to code. Um, but some of the most successful product managers that I've worked with are technical enough that they can understand um, what the team is talking about when they say like, what's hard, what's easy, what's possible, what's not. Well, I don't really believe that anything's not possible. It's just like, what's hard or what's easy. Um, so there are some product managers I've worked with that, that do code, um, but it's, it's pretty rare and usually they're doing more front end code. Um, so I don't know, Justin, if I'm answering your question, but I hope that that was helpful. The remaining questions are inside the Q and A function. Thanks. Um, next question is, I want to be a business analyst. What should I start with? Oh man. Um, so business analysts and product managers often have some similar things that they need to do. Um, there are some really good resources. Hold on. I kind of want to like search Slack for them. There's some really good resources that, that you can use to like learn about how to be a product manager, how to like pass product manager interviews. Um, but I would say that like a business analyst, um, they, they have different business analysts and product managers are sometimes similar, sometimes different in, in different companies. But a lot of what business analysts do is, is figure out, you know, what are the requirements from customers and how do I translate that into a way that, um, that various teams can understand. And so to me, a business analyst role is, is a lot like a translator and a teacher. Um, but I'm happy to, I think there are some resources that, um, actually a product manager had sent me recently um, that I can I can just put in the chat when I find them for um, some resources for business analysts. Um, what are some of the challenges you face when changing careers? Um, <laughs> yeah, so first is that that it's pretty difficult um, where uh, to, to get into engineering as a non-engineer, as someone who doesn't have any experience in engineering. Um, or sorry, in software engineering, that's something that uh, I think a lot of people are trying to navigate now, uh, people who are changing careers or people who are wanting to get into software. Um, it's hard to get in the door of like, how do I get in the door at a company or how do I get in the door as a software engineer? And the way I did it, um, I highly recommend just like uh, exploiting your networks to their fullest. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes I've made often in my career is, especially early in my career, is I felt weird or uncomfortable reaching out to people that I didn't know um, or, or reaching out to people to try to say, hey, like, I know you, do you have any roles? Um, but I really wish that I had done that. Um, the second, the first job I got at a software engineering company, I, uh, I knew I wanted to move to Wisconsin because I had some friends out there and it sounded, uh, Madison, Wisconsin seemed like a cool city. Um, and so I actually went to my college's alumni network and just found people that lived in Madison and just contacted them and see if, and saw if they were hiring. And that's how I got the role in, in tech. And I got it as a, um, as a project manager, but then was able to sort of move into a software management role. The other thing I'd recommend is uh, working for smaller organizations. Um, if you want to do that, once you get to larger organizations, sometimes it can be a lot harder to make lateral moves into teams that aren't the same. Um, and so like, I would recommend smaller organizations like under a hundred or 200, if you, if you want to like start in one role and then use that to leverage moving into a software engineering role. We got, oh, data scientist. Oh man. Um, I wish I knew more about data science. Uh, what's the right way to, to be a data scientist? I know that there's data science boot camps now. Um, and that's like, I, I, unfortunately, I wish I were more of an expert on this. And John, I don't know if you have any thoughts too, but there are data science boot camps now. But um, the hardest thing, things about data science are like the math and also trying to help people understand how data science is used. Data science is one of those things where a lot of uh, CEOs like know it's a really big idea and we should be doing it, but like a lot of them don't really know how we actually do it. Like no, no one knows how to say, how do we apply data science to actually solve like real problems? Um, so I think that uh, I'd recommend uh, reading up on it, learning on data analysis, um, math, things like that. Those are the types of like hard skills you'll need to know. 
But then something that'll set you above everyone else is like, is like actually understanding how to apply data science to real world problems um, to solve things for people. But that wasn't the greatest answer. I, I don't know as much about data science as I, as I wish I did. Um, top things a product manager expects from a junior dev trying to break into tech. Um, it depends on the size of the organization, but I would say that if your product manager is working really directly with the junior devs, which will probably be at a smaller organization. Well, it depends. Anyway, if, you're, if your product manager is working more directly with a junior dev, um, what they're looking for is someone that is able to take a non-technical concept and translate it into technical work. So they'll say like, hey, the customers um, uh, are, were confused by the fact that like, they needed to do this step, but it was really unclear where the button was and we need to surface it in a better place. Um, and they'll probably have some ideas for you of like, how, how do we surface that better? Um, but someone who's able to take that sort of non-technical discussion about customer needs and say, okay, I get it. Here's the changes I need to make and here's how long it's gonna take and here's how complex the work is. Um, so doing that translation is really helpful as a junior dev. Um, and then uh, as you start to get more senior, I start to look for engineers who say, hey, you know, you, you said that it was confusing for customers and we need to move this button here, but have we thought about actually making this other change that might actually solve the customer problem better? And then being flexible about what the product manager, um, uh, the product manager's ideas and, and user research. So that's what I start to look for more senior devs, but in junior devs, it's like, how do you translate what the product manager said into, into what you need to do? And how do you um, make sure that you're expressing how long it'll take, how complex the work is, and, and be pretty consistent about delivering it? What skills or resources uh, do you think were the most helpful to transition between roles? Um, so I mentioned this already, but like uh, connections are, are important of just like trying to um, Forge connections with people who are um, that you might know outside of work for some reason, or part of, like as an alumni association or organization, as an example, or making connections within your company to try to get to know people. Um, and then uh, the other thing I'd recommend is if, if you're able, if you're at the same company as someone else and you want to transition roles into another team, um, one, make sure that you're a good performer on your team. Otherwise, people are going to be less likely to want to. Um, uh, let you move teams, but uh, then offer to do work for that team. Say like, hey, do you have any side projects that like aren't super time sensitive that I could help out with? Or do you need help in some area that I can help with? And sort of show that you have those skills or those abilities. Um, I'm a big self learner. And so um, I, I, this is like, maybe not what people want to hear, but like Google is my friend. If I don't know how to do something, I'll Google it or I'll try it out and then iterate. Um, there are some, uh, there's like specific resources that I'm sure that are available for any particular area, but um, I always, I always like just try things and iterate as a, as a really good tool for getting better. Just making sure that you're really open to feedback along the way and improving. What have you learned about imposter syndrome and how do you feel about the advice to fake it till you make it? Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, I'm not always the best person to answer this. Maybe I'm too confident. I don't know. I've always felt like um, people have underestimated me my entire career rather than overestimated me. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to show people that I am better than they think than they think I am. Um, it's like partly to do with, I'm sure my gender, uh, partly to do with the fact that I've, I've advanced pretty quickly. So I'm pretty young for someone in my role. Um, but I will say that, uh, Imposter syndrome, I, I definitely struggled with a, a lot with something like this in college where everything was just way too hard and I assumed everyone else was smarter than I was and I didn't know what I was doing and it caused me a lot of anxiety. Um, and so I think that the, yeah, the advice I think I have is like fake it till you make it is pretty good advice. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, I feel like I often give people advice in situations where they, they want to know what to do. And my advice is like, stand in your space, like be you, you have value. Your value is like something very specific and you have something to bring to the table. And the more that you can like show that you have value in like a gentle, but, but gentle yet forceful manner of, of like presenting that value and presenting those opinions to people, the more people will realize that you have value. Um, and the more you'll realize that you have value. 
Um, the other thing I really like is um, make yourself available as someone who's really open to feedback. Um, because when you get that, when you are getting a very good stream of feedback from people, you'll start to realize that most people think you're pretty cool um, and, and not that you're terrible. So um, I think Figure Team Make it's pretty good, um, pretty good one. Also, try not to stress about it. Just try, try to like be in your space and, and know what you're good at and, and constantly try to improve um, at everything else. Uh, all right, what are some recurring obstacles you've seen junior engineers struggle with during tech interviews and how can they overcome them? Um, yeah, I think that hmm, actually, John, are you willing to answer this question about tech interviews? Because I think you probably have done a lot more recent tech interviews than I have. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think I see a lot of, can you hear me? Yeah. I like don't know how any of this works in the webinar mode. Um, I've seen a lot of junior developers uh, struggle with um, the idea that, and this kind of connects to the previous answer, there's a little bit of like, um, when you're in a tech interview wanting to, like part of the interview is wanting you to try to solve the problem even if you don't know how to solve it. And a lot of junior developers get hung up on the fact that they think they're supposed to come into the interview with the ability to solve the problem that I'm supposed to just be able to walk in and solve it. And the more senior you get, the more you realize that the interview is really about um, let's work together and figure out the problem and being able to have the confidence to make space for yourself to say, like, I don't actually know how to do that, but like, let's break it down, break the problem down into pieces and figure it out. I think that's the, the best tip I would give for junior engineers. Yeah, I think I love that. I think that um, when I think about that question, I also think about like, what are the biggest pitfalls that junior engineers fall into when they're on the job? Um, and I think a good, another good one actually that you already mentioned is, is not being able to break down problems well. So like, don't, um, yeah, of like breaking down the problem and figuring it out and not letting yourself get overwhelmed by something that seems complicated. Um, one of the most valuable skills that I learned in college is that like everything is possible. There's nothing that's impossible. You can figure it out with enough time and effort um, and, and or help. Uh, and so I think that's a really great, that's my favorite uh, characteristic that people bring to the job is grit. Um, the other thing that I think junior engineers, like pitfalls that they fall into when they're new in the role is actually not um, on the software side, not knowing enough about um, like operations and DevOps. That's something that I always try to encourage new engineers to learn is like learn how database performance issues can affect your code. Um, learn how to dive into a query that's not working um, and or that's not performing well and figure out how to use it. Because those are the types of skills that most engineers generally don't have and makes you really marketable um, if you can code and understand um, ops. Uh, <laughs> that's not a question. I'm sure that you would climb the ranks fast. It'd be great. You, you're going to do great. Um, um, Mary, yeah. it just in the, in the, we have like a lot of questions here. There's yeah. like 20 questions remaining. I want to give you an opportunity to kind of like um, to cherry pick some questions and kind of figure out um, if there are particular ones that you want to focus on and then also share where people might be able to reach you or follow you for more type yeah, yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. yeah let me, um, thanks for jumping in. Let me. So first, and I definitely in no way I'm trying to cut you off. I just no, 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 you're great. Yeah. You're great. This is I'm glad um, I just put my LinkedIn profile in the chat. Um, so feel free to connect with me there. Um, let me see. Let me scroll to things that I might be we'll link that useful. LinkedIn um, in the after class notes as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, man, I love this. I'm going to skip down to this call. This one. Do you think college is worth it? Ooh. Um, so I have spicy takes on this, which is I think that college degrees are overrated. Um, some of the best people I've worked with don't have college degrees. Um, but I will say that I have noticed that a lot of the industry cares about college degrees. Um, and uh, so that's something to keep in mind is like people care about a degree and, and that being on your resume. I don't, some people do. I think more and more in tech, people are caring less and less about college degrees, um, which is great. That's a great thing to see. Um, I think that college is only worth it if you, if you feel like it really brought you some value that's helping you in your long-term career. Um, you can figure out anything on the job 
Um, the thing that I found useful about my college is like, it threw me into the fire. Um, and I was just like four years of just like in the fire, trying to figure out, trying to swim. Uh, I've mixed all the metaphors. Um, and so it really taught me that like, you might think that anything's impossible, but uh, things are possible. Uh, and, and, and you don't realize it until you do it over and over again. Um, so I found that really, really useful. What's interesting is just random side note. What's interesting is I've also found that a lot of people that, um, were in the military have a very similar mindset on that. Um, and I like, I find, uh, I love working with people that have been in the military at some point or another, because there's a really interesting, um, there's a level of grit, uh, there that, that I love to see. Um, so anyway, my, I don't know, spicy take is I don't think college is worth it for, for most people. And I don't really look for college degrees, but I know that some people out there do. Um, let me see what else do I want to answer. Oh, but I like the next one too. Okay. According to your experience, is it useful to have brainstorming with people, freelancers, not pertaining to the company? Um, I, I am biased on this. So just want to say like, I have an opinion and I think my opinion might not be balanced as it should be. I don't really like talking to like freelancers. Um, I don't really like, um, I forget the name of the company. There's some like big company. It's not McKesson, but it sounds like McKesson that like does product management, uh, uh, like consulting. And I, I just don't think it's useful. It's like you, um, what you want to do as an organization is you want to hire the smartest people you can, and then you want them to learn about your organization so that they can help you. Um, most people outside your organization aren't really going to understand as a freelancer or anything. Um, that being said, I love connecting with people in the industry about problems that I'm having. Um, my, my partner is actually also a director of engineering, but just at a different company. Um, and I love bouncing stuff off of him all the time of like, hey, I'm having this problem with management. Like, what do I do? Yeah, McKinsey, thanks. Um, and anyway, so I, I, I love talking to people in the field about like similar problems that they're having because they have great insights, but I'm not a really big fan of like freelancers. But like I said, I, I, I should, some, some freelancers are useful for some companies to inject like new ideas that people haven't had. I think they're more useful for larger companies than smaller startups that are growing where you're constantly have um, new people getting added. Um, okay. I can also add my Twitter handle. My Twitter is like not very interesting though. Um, I'm not very good at being interesting on Twitter. Um, let me see what else. There, I just put in my Twitter handle. Um, let me see. Oh, I don't like, I have a question that like, I don't even know how to answer, but I just want to highlight it because it's such a good question of like, how do you get a first job um, as a woman with kids, if you don't want to delegate their upbringing to daycare completely. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, uh, I don't think John or, or I have really good answers on this. This is one of the hardest problems I think of our, of our country and maybe other countries as well Is like, we as a country do just honestly a terrible job of like taking care of parents. Um, I, there, I would recommend if it's possible, like if you want to do a part-time gig, um, that's something that would be like freelance work or part-time work as like a web developer or something that, that could be something that, that you could do. Um, but uh, that's a really hard, hard question to answer. Love to like troubleshoot with you more if you want, but one of the hardest questions of our ages actually. <laughs> um, okay. Let me see what else. But John, how much more time I have like so much time, but I know that we need to end this by a particular time. What yeah, I think because we have a lot to cover today and we're just starting the course that we probably don't have time for many more questions. Okay. Um, and that, now I'm like making a mental note that maybe in the future we should have the, this part at the end so that we could just go <laughs> as long as, as we want. Yeah, totally fine. Um, are there any, John, that you saw that you really want me to answer? Um, you answered the spicy one, which is, do you think college is worth it? Yeah, which is great. Oh, I love spicy questions are my favorite, everybody. Um, I guess I actually, there is one that I think would be perfect for you. Um, <laughs> Where is it? Uh, I'm new in the salary negotiation scenario as a female, what has helped you navigate this? Any tips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a, uh, this is a hard one. If you, um, if you're like negotiating in an organization that you haven't been at before, like if you're starting as a new hire, some things to remember, um, 
organizations are some in some states organizations are legally not allowed to ask you what you made before. Um, so I would look up uh, wherever the organization is headquartered or wherever they're hiring you in. I would look that up and know your rights ahead of time. It's like, hey, you know, you're not really supposed to ask me. I'd prefer not to state. Or I, I wouldn't say I, you're not supposed to ask me. I'd say, hey, I'd prefer not to state that. Um, it is, a lot of companies do take advantage of the fact that people don't know that's not allowed and they will ask anyway. Yeah. Um, right, there's even like, even non-maliciously, a lot of employees don't know that there is that there are those regulations and will ask um, just like as a matter of their interview or whatever. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, so I think that's the biggest one is like, don't tell them what your previous salary is if you can avoid it. If they press the issue, and this is easy, for, I would like to say, I'm about to say this, this is easy for me to say, because I already have a job and I'm already established in the field. But like my initial reaction is if somebody pressured me to tell me their, my salary, I'd be like, I don't want to work for you. Uh, you clearly don't value diversity and inclusion if you're pressuring me to tell me what my previous salary was, which is not best practice. Um, like I said, easy for me to say I'm already established in, in the role, but that's 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 a usually a bad indicator that that company is not going to support you very well. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, um, I think uh, probably you already know this because you asked the question, but women are penalized more than men for for negotiating for their salary. Um, and so, uh, like, this is this is advice that I'll give because uh, the the way I'm framing this advice is this is stupid that you have to do this. I don't agree that this is something that you have to do, but the fact we live in the world that we live in. And so this is the advice I'm going to give, which is um, know that you, you can't push as much as a man might be able to in that role. And I think also as, a, as uh, I think people of color have similar penalties that they face for trying to negotiate on salary. So um, like rule number one is, is, is try not to tell them your salary if you can. Um, my general rule for negotiating is always have a backup plan always know, like, if you can't walk away, you've already lost. Um, so, so always have a backup plan, always be able to walk away, always have another option on the table if you can. Um, and if you don't know that you don't, and you, you probably already lost that negotiation. Um, but also just remember that, like, if you're not, if you're not a cis man, you probably won't be able to push as hard for the salary. Um, unless you're able to find an organization that is really strong with diversity and inclusion. Um, and you can usually find that out by connecting with other people in the organization that are from an underrepresented group and just like asking them what it's like to work there as a, someone from an underrepresented group. Um, and you can find that stuff out ahead of time. But ideally you can find an organization that really values diversity and inclusion and you won't have as much of an issue here, but um, that's not a lot of companies. So I'm trying to give you advice for the general company. Awesome. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. Yeah, um, thank you, John. This was fun. Mary used to be my manager and has done just amazing work at the company um, on a lot of initiatives that I think would be important to a lot of people here, as well as like being my sounding board for this course in general. Uh, Mary was kind of the person I wrote her a message and I was like, I'm really um, upset about this. I'd like to do something about it. Um, and she told me I wasn't crazy. So Mary's pretty directly responsible for the fact that we have this class at all. Okay, well, now I'm getting embarrassed because that's too many compliments. Um, I'm gonna make you the host and see what happens. Okay. Oh, well, wow, we both have video at the same time. It's like magic. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, that, you have my link, uh, LinkedIn, you have my uh, Twitter. Reach out to me if you have questions or if you wanna talk about something, I'm happy to. Chat. Everyone say thank you, Mary. Mary, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, John. And thanks, everyone. Your questions were excellent. So thanks for asking, especially the spicy ones. <laughs> All right. Should I? I should probably leave now, huh? I, I mean, it's up to you. You do it. Okay. You want. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna leave now. All right. Thanks, All right. everyone. See you. Bye. Okay, everyone. Now you are stuck with me again. Um, if you liked what Mary had to say, which it would be, I don't know, pretty crazy not to because she's amazing. Uh, you could feel free to reach out to Mary on LinkedIn um, or follow her on Twitter. And I think she doesn't really use Twitter too much, but um, she'd still appreciate kind of the, the action of following. Uh, it's nice to know that when you say something that it's meaningful to other people. And that's, I think like what that can, what that can help get across. Also, Mary just sent me a message with some um, product management resources that I'm going to try to link in the notes after um, after the class. Now, in the meantime, we have a lot of stuff to cover, and uh, it is 
30, 50 minutes into the class. So I am going to share my screen uh, and we're going to get started. Um, so I will uh, just a kind of as a note um, to, in order to keep things going, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to have to be answering less questions uh, in the moment. Um, so people can be talking in Slack and can answer questions if I don't answer your question directly. I mean, I'll still try to answer your question directly. Um, but if I, if you see something in the chat that you know the answer to, please do me a favor and answer it there. Um, make sure that you have panelists and attendees selected when you answer. Okay, so let me figure out how to get, <coughs> get this going, get my chat back. Okay, you all see my screen. Great, cool. So the first thing I promised you is that I'm going to show you uh, in the code spaces how to get started. Again, like if you're having trouble with code spaces, please, like the, the format of the class is lecture based. So you don't need to solve your problem right now. Um, if you have questions that are more about like the thing that I'm doing, feel free to drop them here um, and I will try to answer them. But if it's about code spaces, either reach out in Slack or um, yeah, that's it. Um, I will try to increase the size of the letter, although there is a limit to how big I can go and still do the things that we need to do. That's probably pushing it. So this is kind of where we're, where we're at. Okay, so you create a new file. You're gonna put some Ruby code into there. And then uh, if you've installed the extension, which you all should have installed by now, uh, I can show you quickly how to install extensions. You go to this extensions area and you in particular would like to make sure that the code runner extension is installed. That's made by Jun Han. Um, if you have more questions about that or this does not seem familiar, just watch the video from yesterday and it's gonna be in there. You're gonna right click it and you click run code and then you'll see the output down below. So that's how you use code spaces. Now I also promised you that I would show you how to get that code saved into your repository. And that's what I'm going to do right now. So when we, uh, when we are editing files, you're noticing that the files are turning green. And the reason that they're turning green is because they, um, they are not saved into uh, your Git repository yet. Okay, so that's why they're green. So we need to resolve that. We need to figure out how to make them essentially not green anymore. There's this tab over here to the left-hand side. It says GitHub. Um, if I click into that, I can see a bunch of details about the GitHub repository. And if I go back here, there should be a way to, let me find it. Um, this is another, another case of I have not done this before. So uh, give me a second and we're gonna figure it out. Uh, can't help but feel like I'm losing some interface here because uh, third option in the panel. Ah, perfect, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so the third option in the panel shows me which files I've changed here. Uh, and when I've changed files, there's this little plus button. So what the plus button is gonna do is it's gonna say, oh, this is a file that I actually want to um, put to GitHub. So I click that plus and it's gonna move it into this separate area. So the things in the changes area are things that will not go to GitHub. The things in the staged area are things that will go to GitHub. And then there's a button up here that you can either create a pull request or you can click commit. So because I don't want you all to worry about pull requests yet, I'm just gonna click commit. And it's gonna ask you for a message. Uh, the message should describe what you've done. So I'm gonna say add main.rb and I hit enter. And now you've noticed that the changes that I staged are disappeared from this area. And that is because those were the things that I wanted to go to GitHub and now I've sent them away. These are the things that I've chosen to not send to GitHub. They're still sitting here. Okay, so now if I go over to my repository, which I'll open in a new tab. Do, do, do. I'm gonna make sure I'm in the right repository. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I haven't pushed yet, so. 
the last step is to go into here. If, if my browser was more expanded, which yours will be, you would see this better. You'll have to click push. So there's a lot of steps, um, but they all have their purpose. And we can talk about that. Uh, we can talk about that someday too, why all of these steps are there. But once I've pushed, if I refresh the tab, I'm gonna see my file. And now when I click into main.rb, I can see it and I can see my message that I added, uh, make that bigger. I can see the file and I can see the message that I've added. So that's a lot. That's how it works. If you have questions about it when you're going through it, um, either ask in Slack or we can talk more about it at the end of the class. Um, but that is definitely a flow that you're gonna to wanna to figure out. You're not gonna need it, need it immediately, but it is something you'll wanna figure out. Um, I wanted to talk briefly before the break, I realize we're kind of at the point where the break would be, but I wanna talk briefly about, um, yeah, code spaces takes a little bit to get ready. I wanna talk a bit about uh, why Ruby and what's nice about Ruby. And to do that, I'm going to start by showing you JavaScript. So this code is JavaScript. Um, JavaScript, like I said yesterday, is not a good language to learn programming on, in my opinion, because it is just too, um, it's too complicated that there are too many edge cases. And I think I mentioned this yesterday, it is a type of language called a prototypical or prototype based language um, that is not like basically any other language that you're gonna work with. Uh, Ruby on the other hand is what's called an object oriented language. That is like a lot of other languages. So uh, Python, um, Java, C++, like all of these languages are object oriented. So it's a very common mindset and way to think and something that pretty much all developers should get used to knowing. So I'm gonna take this JavaScript file and I'm gonna take some pieces away from it and show you kind of what's going on here. Um, so the first thing is that this first line, if you read it, it says const number equals five. Now, as a programmer, I kind of know what those things mean, but like, what is const? What is number? What is equals five? So number is probably like the name of something. Equals five is the part that it equals. Then there's this like weird semicolon thing on the end. Um, so imagine if you did not need the semicolon, which in JavaScript, technically you don't, you could take it away. Um, and then because const, let's just say we don't know what it does. Uh, imagine you did not need const either. And now let's look at this next line. So it's if, then there's a little parenthesis, then there's some stuff in here, another parenthesis, and there's a curly brace and another curly brace. Um, yeah, so I don't know why there's three equal signs here. So imagine if there were only two. I don't know uh, why these little parentheses are here. So these parentheses are very, um, these are things that trip up new developers because these parentheses are things that are easy to forget because it's like, why is that even there? So imagine we remove the parentheses and then you have this little curly brace, very confusing. Imagine we took away the curly brace. So we need this end curly brace so that we know kind of what this piece of code does. Um, and then we have a method call here. And so in Ruby, that would just look like this puts. And the end curly brace, we'd replace with the word end. So this is the Ruby equivalent of the same thing. Now, I don't know about you, but when you read this Ruby equivalent, it makes a ton more sense. So that you can read it like it's English. You can say, oh, number equals five. Say if number equals five puts number. Puts you can think of as output to the screen. So this is why people like Ruby. It's a very kind of brief explanation of why Ruby is an important language. It's a powerful language and it's a language that um, is expressive and easy to read. That's why in this course, we're gonna focus on Ruby first, not only because it's an amazing, great, fast, wonderful language, but also because it's easy to, for people to understand. Uh, don't worry about the equals equals in the if statement. We are going to get there tomorrow. We have so much. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. Uh, we're going to go on a break now. The break's only going to be five minutes. Um, so please enjoy your five minute break. I'm going to stick around and I'm going to answer questions. Um, the questions, I'm not going to answer questions about this exercise. In fact, like 
I'm going to erase the exercise because we're writing Ruby here, not JavaScript. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, talking through some of the questions that were left over just in the break because um, I want to make sure that we don't skip over the questions that people might like. And I have a couple minutes here, so let's go. Um, how is Ruby used in GitHub? Is it only in the infrastructure? No, it's not only in the infrastructure. The actual web application is written in Ruby. So when you go to GitHub.com, the thing that you're talking to is a Ruby app. How do you get into UX research? Um, it's outside the scope of this course, but there are boot camps for UX research as well. Uh, project engineer, do you have any advice for getting into data center engineering? Uh, I do not in particular, but probably a similar thing where you'd want to find a, a, a boot camp like this one. Um, there's so many questions here. Yeah, if you search for questions in the questions repository and you can't find it yet, um, you're probably just not part of the GitHub team. If you email me, I will fix it. Uh, what are the chances of USA companies hiring foreigners for IT jobs? Happens all the time, uh, especially at GitHub. I mean, we, I think uh, only 70% of our workforce is based in America. So we have people in Europe um, we have a headquarters in uh, in Amsterdam, and we also have headquarters in uh, in Tokyo. And that is not um, that's not an outlier. A lot of larger tech companies have the same. Um, electrical engineering. If you're coming from electrical engineering background, you're gonna you're going to find a lot of parallels in software engineering. It just takes a little bit of like squinting to see them. Uh, software engineer, what are the biggest challenges on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I don't know. After a while, it's like people, people are, people are challenged. You know, like at the end of the day, software is written by people, so um, people have different opinions, and that's that's where the real challenges are. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the benefits of Ruby over Python, although I appreciate the question. I did talk about it a little bit yesterday, so if you rewatch that, then um, then you can see it. Um, I also think that, like I said yesterday, it's not important what the benefits are. It's more about just doing something. Uh, Work-life balance as a software developer. I, I know a lot of software developers that have good work-life balance. You have to find the right company. Um, positions in tech where you get the foot in, foot in the door. Most companies uh, have junior engineering programs where that's that's the point of the program. Um, you have a CS master's, but still struggle to get interviews. Um, I would work on your resume and try to maybe get some experience with something like open source. Um, CCNA networking, anything to do more opportunities in dev. I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar, but if you re-ask this question with more detail, I can help you hopefully at the end of the class. Okay, I'm gonna stop answering questions because it's 6.05 and we have like a week of material to get through in the next hour. Um, I might end up staying late. I don't know if people can do that, but it might happen. Okay, so like I said, Ruby is a clean language. Ruby is readable. Uh, it does not have as many quirks. This language was like JavaScript. It's object-oriented, which is a fantastic way for a language to be, which we'll talk about um, in two days from now. Uh, I think a lot of people wonder, like, is Ruby used in production? I'll tell you that I write Ruby every day when I build um, github.com. It is also used at Basecamp, where Rails, the framework that we're going to learn, was invented. Uh, it's also the primary web framework for Airbnb, Groupon, Shopify, parts of Twitter, Dribbble. Um, there are a tremendous amount of apps that are built and run on Ruby and Rails. It's not an uncommon framework. Um, it is, if you've heard that like it can't scale, that is, um, that's not true. So I, I make a living scaling it. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about where you find documentation as well. So there's a site called ruby-doc.org um, or you can just Google something. So as I'm going through things and I'm saying like, 
today we're going to talk about the class integer. If you just Google integer class Ruby, you're going to end up on this page, the rubydoc.org page. And um, over time, you're going to learn to read this file easily. You're going to learn to kind of figure out where to find different pieces of information, just because, um, like I said yesterday, you're going to be doing a lot of research on your own. Um, there are a lot of boot camps that go through and try to talk about like every method that exists on every class or like um, some people on the call that I've talked to are maybe in a JavaScript boot camp or something and they'll spend all of the time going through all the things you can do with like an array or an object. That's not how you should learn, at least in my opinion. The way you should learn is by going and doing the, doing the thing and kind of learning things as you need them. It's like you don't start learning a language like a spoken language by just learning all the nouns. You start by just talking and then picking up the nouns that you need over time. And programming is the same thing. So the first thing we're gonna talk about in Ruby is how to output something. And we've actually already talked about that. And it's with the puts, puts, and then surround the thing you wanna output with these little quotation marks. So why do we need to learn to output something? It's because if we write some code, we need to be able to see what the code does. So outputting something is an easy way to be able to determine that the code is doing what we expect it to do. Just to break down this line, I'll make it a little bigger. Just to break down this line a bit, a bit, the puts makes you output something to the screen. And then there's a space. And then there's quotation marks around the thing that you wanna output. So when I write puts, space, hello world in, in quotes, that is going to output hello world. And that's exactly what it does. You can see when we run it. So if I right click here, uh, like I can't run from that. If I right click file, click run code, you'll see that it outputs hello world. So you're probably wondering the obvious thing here, what are these quotation marks for? So what the quotation marks are is they are for turning hello world into a string. You don't need to know right now what a string is. We're gonna cover that in this hour at some point. But what's important to know is that when you wanna output something, these quotation marks have to be around the thing that you wanna output. And this works for other things too. So you wanna, uh, my name is John. And now if I run this, you can probably guess what's gonna happen. Now I've outputted hello world. And I've outputted my name is Sean. Yeah. There's another type of thing that you can do in code that is not coding, uh, but is going to be useful on your journey to learn to code, uh, and it's writing comments. So this is how you write a comment. A comment is any line in Ruby that starts with the hash, hash symbol. So the hash symbol looks like this, and you notice that when I type that, it turned gray. Anything that has a hash and then has something after it is a comment. And you might be wondering why would I wanna write something in this code file that isn't code? Uh, and the reason is because you wanna add commentary alongside your code. So maybe you write something like output who this is. And when you write that, it doesn't actually do anything to the code. So if I go um, and I run this, again, which I can do like this, uh, this, I think there's a keyboard shortcut that I'm trying to, trying to use, uh, control option N. So if I output it, if I run it again, you're going to see here that it outputs the exact same thing. Um, and the comment is basically completely ignored. So when you're, when you're getting started, writing comments is an easy way to, um, to document what you're doing. So now I'm gonna talk about variables. Variables are kind of the building block of all of programming. So in order to, to describe a little bit what a variable is, I'm gonna use this tool called Whimsical. So what I want you to think of a variable is, I want you to think of it as a name and a value. That's what it is. It's a name and a value put into a box together. So when you have a name, make the name be number and make the value equal to 42. And what's nice about that is that now everywhere 
you can reference the number 42 using the name number. So that's all a variable is. It's a box that has a name and a value. You can even think of it as like the box is named number and has the value 42. Yeah, 42, the meaning of life. Um, so how do you create a variable in Ruby? Let's convert that drawing that I just did into Ruby code. This is what it looks like. So the way that you would read this out loud, it's very important to know how to read all these things out loud so that we can talk about them. You would read this as number equals 42. And notice that when I said that, um, I said number is equal to 42 and not 42 is what's inside number. Uh, and those seem like they're not that much different. And I agree that they're not that much different. Um, but the important statement here is that when you write code, you're not saying put 42 into number. I think a lot of people think think of it like that. And that's, what, that's what's happening. You're putting 42 into a number. But what's really happening is you're telling the computer number is equal to 42. It's a statement. It's not a request of the computer. It's a statement. It's saying, here's something that is true. Number equals 42. So when I say number equals 42, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm telling the computer. I'm not, saying, um, I'm not saying set number to 42, please. I'm saying number is 42. Um, that's going to, I think that that's something that confuses a lot of people and we are going to uh, run into later why it is. So when you say this line out loud, say number equals 42. So you probably saw me use these equal signs before. And what I was doing with the equal signs is I was doing what's called a comparison. So. Let's say I did this, puts number equals equals 42. So is any idea what this is gonna output? Does anyone have an idea what this is gonna output? Yep. So let's run it again. And you're gonna see the output here is true. Now, why is it true? Uh, the reason that it is true is because what we're asking with the double equal sign is we're saying, instead of assigning something, now I want to compare two things. So I'm going to say, is number have the value 42? Or more importantly, is number referring to 42? Um, and if the answer is true to this comparison, then it will output true. So I can do that with other things. So I can say, is number not equal to 42? Oh, and anyone that's wondering why this is double equal sign instead of single equal sign, uh, the reason that it is double equal sign is because if this was single equal sign, then what this would actually be saying is puts number equals 42, which would essentially do the same thing that this line did. It would assign 42 into the number. Now, okay, the next line, I want you to read this as number is not equal to. 42. And if I run this code, we are going to see true and then false. And the reason is because this one is true and this one is false. And that should make sense because if number equals 42, um, then number does not equal 42 should be false the other way around. You can do other ones. If number is greater than 35 or 35, that's going to be true. So this is um, this is as much math as we're probably going to do in this course. But being able to compare two numbers is just with this greater than sign. And you can probably imagine that the opposite of that is less than. Uh, and there are also even forms like this. So when you're in high school math and they talked about greater than or equal to, it was it was drawn as like that. Uh, it was like this. Right, and it was like this, whoa, software. And it was like that, right? Now, there is no symbol like this in 
computers, unfortunately, um, at least for us to use. So what we use instead is greater than followed by an equal sign. They need to be in that order. They cannot be the other way around. The other way around means something different, which we are gonna learn about very, very soon. Another one that you might wanna know is the fact that you can actually combine these things together. Um, and this is probably not, um, we're gonna figure out what this means, but you can do something like puts number equals 42 and number uh, is greater than 25. So what this is saying is just read it out loud and think about what it means. It's saying, okay, does number equal 42 and number is greater than 25? That's what this means. This double sign here means and. So when you read it out loud, it makes a ton of sense. Does number equal 42 and number is greater than 25? Of course, the answer is yes, because number is 42 and 42 is greater than 25. Similarly, you can do ors, number equal 42 or number equal 25. Same thing, read it out loud. Does the number equal 42 or does the number equal 25? Sure, the number is 42. So because it accomplishes one of those things, it's true. And I just really wanna break that down a little bit. I'm gonna try to do this super quick. Um, let's say you have two things. You have thing one and you have what? Okay, my software is jumping all over the place. Thing one and you have thing two. I'm gonna talk about how and works real quick. So let's say thing one is true. And let's say thing two is false. So in an and situation, in an and situation, if one is true and the other is false, the answer is false. Meaning and requires that both of these things are true. So if either one is false, then false. Or on the other hand, means if either of these is true. So in this case, is either of true or false true? Yes. If they're both true, the answer will still be true because one of true or true is true. And the only case where an or will be false is the case where both are false because in that case, neither are true. I hope this makes sense. There are tables that you can look up here. Um, uh, someone in the chat pointed out that in Ruby, there's also an operator where you can write and here. Uh, that is jumping ahead. And I basically would recommend that no one ever use that operator. Um, there are cases where it's appropriate, but it's more confusing than it is appropriate. Never use and, never use or, always use double and or double or. Um, also, if you can't find this symbol on your keyboard, it's what's called a pipe symbol. It's not used by most people, so it's a little confusing to find, but it's the shift key directly above the return on most keyboards. Uh, yes, Ruby has and or or. Forget that you ever heard that they exist, don't use them. Um, yeah, in Python, they uh, that is how you use and and or. This is not Python though, this is Ruby. Um, so don't use them. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about why not to use and or, or if you want to sit after the class, I'll tell you why not to use and or, or, or you can just Google uh, why not to use and or in Ruby. There's um, There are complicated reasons that I'm really not going to be able to describe until the end of the course because they're advanced. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some math operators. So we have number equals 42, um, and I'm only going to talk about these briefly. Most programming courses would go through all of the math operators. I'm not gonna do it. So if you wanna learn about different math operators than these, you're gonna to have to look them up. So let's put the number and then let's put the number plus 42. So I'm gonna run this code uh, using my shortcut that I'm gonna remember hopefully. And you'll see what outputs here. It's 42 and 84. 
So even here, I've done something. I've, I've had Ruby execute some code. So the first one just outputs the number 42 directly. The second one adds 42 to the number. So 42 plus 42 is 84. You can probably guess what all the other ones are. I'm gonna do uh, puts number minus 25, puts number times five. Uh, we can run those. They do exactly what you'd expect them to do. They're not surprising. It's just math. There are other ones. I'm not going to teach them. What I am gonna teach is something that I think is a lot more interesting, which is number.odd. So I'm gonna run this and we're gonna see it output false. Um, excellent use of the water, thank you. Um, I don't think I'm doing very well, but. Okay, so um, what I've done here is I'm calling a method on the variable number. The method name that I am calling is all of this. It's O D D question mark. You're probably, if you've programmed before, super confused about what this question mark is doing here. Um, it is just part of the name of the method. There is nothing at all special about question mark methods. They don't have to return true or false. They don't have to do anything. It's just part of the name. But by convention, what it means is that this method is returning a Boolean. Um, in super technical terms, we would say that this is a predicate method. So it's a method that is returning either true or false. So now let's read it because now we have this nice question mark thing. Let's read this out loud. Puts number odd. Number is odd. Is a lot of a lot of times you'll say is odd, or you'll say odd question mark. So see it outputs false. It outputs false because the number 42 is not odd. You can probably guess there's another method just like it. And as you probably assumed, it's called even. So without even trying, we've learned a couple of things in, in this statement here. We've learned that when you wanna call a method on something, which if that doesn't make sense, it's okay. You use a dot. Um, so you have the variable that you're calling the thing on, you have a dot, and then you have the name of the method that you wanna call. The variable's number, the name of the method is odd question mark. Hope this makes sense. If it makes sense, give me a give me a little give me a yes, give me a something. Okay, great. That's all I'm going to talk about numbers. Done talking about numbers. Um, I'm sure we'll use more numbers because numbers are super cool. But I know that they're really um, annoying for people that don't have backgrounds in math. So I will stop talking about them. Next, I'm gonna talk about strings. So I'm gonna make a string. So what have I done here? This is very similar to the code that I read before. If you remember, I wrote puts, and then in string, I wrote hello world. What I've done here instead is I've taken the string and I'm assigning it into a variable. I've chosen to call this variable str. Uh, I could also just call this variable string. That's fine. So now if I run this code, it's going to output hello world. So it's doing the same thing that the other code was doing. And the only difference is that it's using a variable to temporarily store the string hello world inside the variable. And then it's outputting the value of the string. So that's how you make a string. What can you do with a string once you have it? Well. I'll just show you a couple of things that are built into Ruby so that we can talk about it. Um, if I talk, if I do puts string dot reverse, and I run this code, you'll see that I've outputted hello world, and then I've outputted hello world backwards. So just string dot reverse will take a string and flip it backwards. There are things like uh, I think it's upcase. So I'm going to run that. So now I've taken hello world and I've turned it into all uppercase hello world. And that's great. There's also methods like downcase, uh, just like you would imagine. 
And again, if you go over here to this Ruby doc, I'm just to make this big too. Here's a description of what string, how strings work in Ruby. Down the left-hand side here is a list of all of the methods that exist on string classes. So we can see even in this method here that there's a method called capitalize. So let's go give it a shot. I'm gonna trade upcase out for capitalize. Let's see what it does. Cool, so it capitalized the first letter. And this is how you figure out new things in Ruby. If you want to know how you do something, think of the thing you wanna do, go to the documentation for the class and see if that thing is there. There are a bunch of methods that exist on string that you get for free. And actually when we get into Rails, there are even more methods that you get for free because Rails adds more methods onto the string class in Ruby. Another one I really want to talk about is put string.length. You probably guess what this does. You're going to output. Every time that I say puts, think output. You're going to output strings length. Said out loud, it's puts string.length. Let's run it. You can see hello world, hello world with capital H and 11. Okay, another thing I wanna cover is I wanna talk about what you can do with strings. So we've done this. Now imagine we've taken the world part away and let's change string. Let's rename string, which I think I can do. There's, I know there's some way to do this. Uh, we'll just name it to greeting. Uh, I don't know how to use the editor. I will figure it out eventually. And then what we can do is we can say greeting equals greeting plus world. And you can see it outputted the same thing. Uh, and the reason it outputted the same thing is because um, we're making the same string. So you probably can understand that the plus means take the thing that's in one variable and then add something else to it. There's actually even a, a better way to write this in Ruby because it seems kind of uh, duplicative. So if you use this, you're actually able to push the string into the other string. Another way to write that is like this, if that makes more sense, but I like this better. So it's basically saying, take the string and then take another string and put it in to that original string, modifying the variable. So if I run this again, you'll see the same thing. Imagine we had a name and we wanted to say hello and then the name. We could modify the code um, and we're gonna do that right now. So instead of world as a string here, I'm gonna put name. Uh, it is not a bitwise operator. Uh, I could talk about bitwise operators, but it's, it's beyond the scope of the course. You won't need them to write any kind of web application. Um, and we'll actually talk about it later, but for those of you that are interested in it, uh, the, bit, the, the shift is actually just another method in Ruby, which is really cool. So we'll, we'll talk about that um, later in the course though. So if you do this, um, this shoveling in, now I've replaced world with name and I can run it again. And I output now, hello, John, and hello, John with capital H, and now it's 10. So you can see that all of the operations I've just done with individual strings, I can also do with variables. And that makes sense because saying the literal string with quotes, hello, or sorry, world, is the exact same thing as saying a variable that references the literal string world. They are the same. Um, so I can even do something like this put in name.reverse. We run that. Now you see it's doing the right thing. And there's actually an even cooler way to write this in Ruby. Uh, we're gonna use this a lot. It's called interpolation. So looks like this. And what you can do is you can actually run small pieces of Ruby code inside of strings. So 
what this is saying is when you're setting the variable greeting, set it to the string, hello, and then interpolate name.reverse. So don't, don't feel bad if you don't get this part right away. It's not super crucial that you get it now, but the idea of interpolating a string is something that um, is really nice in Ruby and actually something that later came to languages like JavaScript. So why is it called a string? Um, I'm gonna talk about why it's called a string. It's called a string because at the end, uh, it does not have to be single quotes. These can be double quotes, but if you're interpolated, so someone pointed out that these can be single quotes, which they can. Um, in Ruby, this does not mean something different. In other languages, they might mean that it's a character, um, but the catch is that you cannot interpolate things inside of a single quoted string. So um, for the purposes of learning Ruby, I will tell you, just use double quotes everywhere then you don't have to ever wonder about it. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, I'm gonna talk about ranges real quick. The reason that they call it a string is because it's actually a string of letters. So think about like when you write, um, when you write something, you write, hello, the string is actually, you're writing H, then E, then L, then O. So the string is just all of these things kind of strung together. That's why it's called the string. So that's what these are. Uh, and because of that, we can actually access part of the, um, the letters and we can split them off from the other letters. So if we did something like greetings and then these square braces, which is called a slice, greeting of two, and now I output it, it's going to return Let's go all the way to the bottom, L. The reason it's gonna return L is because L is the character at the second position in the string. Now you're probably looking at it and you're wondering, no, it's not, John, you're dumb. But I'm not dumb, at least not in this particular case. And the reason is because Indexes in pretty much all of programming start with zero instead of one. So the zeroth character is H, the first character is E, and the second character is L. Indexes and counting pretty much everywhere are gonna start at zero instead of one. Um, that is something that I could talk about for hours, why it's important that that's the case, but just know that that's the case. There are historical reasons and there's also just practical reasons why. Um, another thing you can do in Ruby is you can do two dot dot five. So what that means is, let's output it again. Now you see L, L, O, because what this means is give me a substring of the main string that starts at the second position, which is the L, and then goes to the fifth position. So two, three, four, five. That's the substring that we're getting out when we do two dot dot five. So that would make sense if we do two dot dot six, we should see the start of the backwards name, N. Okay, I see some comments in the chat about arrays and probably guess that that's kind of where we're gonna go next. So that's strings, I'm done with strings, that's it. If you got questions about strings, drop them in the questions. We're gonna talk about them. Um, I'm gonna to try to end the class on time, but I will sit here and answer all your questions for as long as we possibly can. So the next thing I wanna talk about is arrays. So an array is an array. I don't want you to think of it as an array. I want you to think of it as an array of values. The way you make an array with a square brace. And you can put things in the array. So I'm gonna put hello, I'm gonna put John, I'm gonna put Kate, I'm gonna put funny, and I'm gonna call this array words. So what I've done is I've created a variable called words, and then I've equaled that variable. I've said the words equals, a statement again, words equals, an array that contains the strings, 
hello, John, Kate, and funny. So square is how you make an array in Ruby. I can actually output, um, although this is not something you would really do, I can output the array. So let's do that and see what it does. You can see what it's done is it's taken all the things in the array, it's just put new lines between them. Another thing to mention about arrays is that they don't have to contain all of the same type of things. So I'm gonna put 42 in there with the other things. I'm gonna hit go uh, and I messed something up. I'm a little confused as to what I, I typoed something. Okay, yeah, I just, I, I guess I just did it before I go, I went or something. Um, but you can see it outputs just the same. So that's how an array works. If you wanna create an array that does not have anything in it, you can do that too. You just put two square braces next to each other and you have created what we call an empty array, an array of nothing. We'll get into why we need arrays um, when, we're, when we're doing the actual course, but you gotta just trust me for now that arrays are a fundamental concept in, uh, in programming. They are absolutely necessary. If you don't know them, you can't program. I'm going to talk about how to put things into an array. So that same operator that I showed you before puts something into an array. Put another thing into an array. So if I run that, now we're going to have another thing at the end of the output. And actually, just in case anyone's wondering, uh, if you had another name that said like, Julian, I guess that's going to be my example every time. Uh, you can you can put variables in here. Uh, you can put variables in here if you wanted to. Variables work the exact same as values. You can use them anywhere you could use a value. So if I run that, you're going to see now Julian at the end. I'm going to talk about some common operations that you will have on. Um, sure, I can pause for a moment. What what's going on? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, there's also gonna be a recording. So if you wanna get things off the screen, uh, you, can, you can watch the recording. So I'm gonna talk about some common operations that you might do with an array. So I'm gonna change this to words.sort. So what that does, um, and I broke it. Oh, there's some kind of there's some kind of like delay between the saving and me running. It's like I'm I'm moving too fast or something. So when I did words.sort, you can see what it did. It put all the words in order. Uh, now, if you're paying really close attention, you'll also notice that I removed 42 before I did that. Now I have to explain why I did that. How do you sort 42 and John? Which one's greater? Now, because that question doesn't make yeah, 42 is greater than because that question doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to compare a number with a string. They're different things. Um, we can't do the sort. And actually, if we start the, the code, we're going to see an error from Ruby. And it's going to say exactly that. It says comparison of integer with string failed. It's, sell, it's telling us that it's trying to do something to compare 42 and John, but it can't. Um, and yes, there are ways around that. And no, I'm not going to talk about them right now. Other operations that exist on array, there are things like reverse, like you had on the string. If you're dealing with an array of only numbers, then you can do things like min or max to get the minimum or maximum number in an array. You can do equal, or you can do things like first or last to get the first element in an array or the last element of an array. So if I were to run this right now, you're gonna see that it outputs Julian, the last thing in the array. Um, and just to really tie it together, if I do words of two, you'll see that it works just like a string. So that outputs Kate. And the reason it outputs Kate is because it is the zero, one, two thing in the array, second position meaning the third physical thing in the array. 
you're probably wondering, can I do this? The answer is yes. So just like a string, arrays work the same. Is a string an array? No, is the answer. There are other languages where that's the case. The answer in Ruby is no, a string is not an array. They just happen to have similar methods. So to make the lot, this is one of the nice things about Ruby is that um, to make things consistent, they make different things that are different work similarly so that you can kind of guess how something might work. There's a lot of times programming in Ruby where um, I'll be using something that I've never used before, and I'll just be able to guess the fact that um, that this object that I'm working with probably has like an include method because like all the other things in Ruby have that method. And uh, we'll talk more about that too, but I just want you to know that arrays support ranges and support positional uh, things just like an array does. Or sorry, just like a string does. Another thing I want to talk about, uh, yeah, I mean, let's try it. So you can see here, now I've got one more. How far can we push it? So if you go off the end of the array, let's say we change this to like 66, not going to be a problem. So, and you'll also notice that it didn't insert a bunch of extra values at the end. It didn't like give you out some random stuff. It just did the right thing. So it constrained it correctly. Uh, if the file is not colored like yours, it means your file does not have a .rb extension. So just make sure that that's the case and then it will fix it. Okay, um, another thing that I wanna talk about with arrays is that you can do assignment. So when I do this, this is saying set words of two, that's the way you would read this, words of two, meaning the second thing inside of the array, I want to equal five. Let's just run it, boom. Second thing in the array is five. Why is it outputting first? It's because we're outputting a slice of the array. Okay, that's a crash course on array. Just like I said before, go to this page. You're gonna see all the things you can do with an array. There's a lot of them. You can intersect things, you can reverse things, you can iterate over things, which we're gonna talk about tomorrow, how to actually use arrays. Um, right now I'm giving you the foundation in what an array is giving you a foundation of what a string is. Tomorrow, we're gonna to spend time using those things. So we're gonna use an array to do something. We're gonna use a string to do something. Okay, we got a couple more things to cover here. The next basic type that I'm gonna talk about, uh, there, there are, um, it's complicated. I think it will distract from the course. So I'm not gonna talk about out of range errors, um, but if you do a little bit of research, you'll, you'll, find, it, you'll find it out. Um, if you have .rb and it's still not working, there is probably some setting somewhere in here to set the syntax type. It looks like down here. So just click that and type in Ruby. And when you click it, it'll fix the highlighting. Okay, the next basic type I'm gonna talk about is the hash. So you have, if you've programmed before, you'll know of this hash as maybe different things. In Python, it's called a dictionary. In JavaScript, it's called an object. In um, other languages like Java, it's called a map, um, but in Ruby, it is called a hash. So um, call it whatever you want, I don't care, but in Ruby, it's called a hash. A hash is just like an array, except let me show you what a hash does. An array is one thing, and then another thing, and then another thing. This is an array. They sit in order. There's one thing, another thing, and another thing. So things you can do with an array, you can say, okay, what's in the first position? You can say, what's in the second position? This is how an array works. This is how you should visualize it. It's things sitting in order. So when you get the address of an array, you really, Sorry, when you, when you reference an array by a variable name, 
you're really looking at the first thing. And you're saying, give me a reference to this array. This is the zero position. This is the first position. This is the second position. Okay. So the way you look things up, just to be really clear about this, and just like, I think it's, you need to understand these things. So I'm going to really just spend some time on it. These, these are how you reference the things in the array. You can think of like the name of the first thing is zero. And we saw that, right? When we wrote the code, we, we took an array and we had array of one, two, three, and then we wrote a R of two, ARR of two, meaning give me the thing in the second position. So if that makes sense, you're essentially saying the name of the thing I wanna get is whatever's in the second position. Now with a hash, hash is a map from key to value. I want you to think of it like a phone book. So when you open a phone book, you're gonna look up a name, you're gonna find the number. That's exactly how a hash works. So instead of being structured like this in an array, I'm going to copy it to here. I'm gonna show you how a hash works. Instead of an array being sequential, like the thing I just showed, they're actually like this. And if I take that and I copy it to here, I'm gonna put these next to it. And I'm gonna say name, John, age, almost 35, um, drink, beer. So this is how a hash works. It is a, a map of one key to one value. Okay, I hope this is making sense. This is an array, it's a thing, list of things in order. This is a hash. It is a list of things where one thing is a key and one thing is a value. The thing you look up by and the thing you find when you look up by that thing. So let's make a new hash. This is what a new hash looks like. An empty hash has just two like this. So the same way that an array had two square braces, a hash has two curly braces. Uh, you can get the curly braces by holding the shift key and having just like where you hit the square braces. So just I'm gonna name these things so that uh, we all talk about them the same way. Square brace, curly brace. Third, third you might see paren or parenthesis. So square brace, curly brace. So you create a hash by using these square braces. Now let's build a hash. Age, 35. Actually, I'm 34, but name, John. Drink, beer. This is a hash. Um, this is, in particular, the exact hash that I just made here. So you can see that a hash is a mapping of one thing to another thing. This equals greater than sign in the middle. What that equal greater than sign means is it's just saying, like an arrow, and think of it like an arrow, it's saying the key to the value. The key is age, the key is the string age, the value is the number 34. Okay. And when you wanna create an empty hash, like I said, just like that. And what are some things that you can do with hashes? Well, the first one, the most important one probably, is that you can access things inside of them. The way you access them is you take the name of the hash, the variable, and then you put a square brace, and then you put the thing that you would like to access, otherwise known as the key. Okay, so I'm going to show that, and it's gonna output John. Um, so that is how you access things inside of a hash. And you can also change the value of things in a hash, just like you would do for an array. So in the array example, I did this. I did array of two equals 24. Remember I set the value to something? You can do the exact same thing with the hash. So we just do hash of name equals um, George. And I'm gonna run that again. And you're gonna see that now it outputs George. 
So I'm able to define a hash, set things into the hash, and output things from the hash. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about common hash methods, but there is obviously the documentation for hash, all of the method names sitting down the left hand side here that you can go look at. But one thing I do want to talk about is hash.include question mark. So you can probably guess what hash.include question mark does. Now let's figure it out together. The question mark means that this method probably, not definitely, is going to return a Boolean value, meaning either true or false. And just get just based on the name, you can probably guess that hash.include question mark is going to tell you whether or not the hash includes something with the key name. So if I run that, you're going to see George true. You're seeing true because of course the hash has a key called name. We're going to get into more methods on hashes and we're going to use hashes a lot in the course. So don't, don't be upset if you're not understanding this right away. I realize that um, it's, a, it's a fairly confusing topic, um, but now we've done numbers, otherwise known as integers, strings, arrays, booleans, and hashes. This is it. These are the primary types in Ruby. These are the ones that you need to worry about. You're gonna learn more. You're gonna learn more tomorrow. You're gonna learn more the next day. You're gonna learn more a year from now. Um, but these are the ones that are the building blocks of all the other ones. So these are the ones you need to know. There's one last thing that I have to talk about because you're gonna need it for the exercise. And that is the if and else clause. So a computer doesn't really do very much if it can't make decisions. Um, meaning like you probably saw all the code that we just wrote and it's not super useful. It's not doing anything. It's like, okay, you told the computer the number was 42 and then you asked the computer if the number was 42, like cool code. But like, that's because we didn't use conditionals yet. We didn't, we haven't reached the point yet where we can make the computer do something to do some work, to make some decisions. And that's what we're about to do. So I'm going to show you very briefly, just so we can get there. So if we say number equals 42, I'm going to say if number equals 42, just like we were writing before, puts hello world. So to read this out loud, and I think like I'm going to keep doing this over and over again, because I think it's very important to be able to talk about code. You're going to do it in your first job. Number is equal to 42. If number is equal to 42, puts hello world. Now, I know program is confusing, but I don't think it can get much clearer than this. I mean, the number equals 42. If the number equals 42, puts hello world. So is hello world going to get output? Yeah, it's definitely going to get output. So let's run the code. Hello world, got output. Um, and we can do a lot of things in here. So if we change this to um, if number equals 24, just to check our sanity, run that again, you're going to see nothing got output. Now, what I just did, uh, meaning checking my sanity, is how you program. It's how everyone programs, even the best programmers in the world. That's how they do it. They do it by having an assumption, doing something to verify the assumption, and then getting better as a result of verifying that assumption. And over time, there are some assumptions that you can kind of just bake in. Like if I have a number that's equal to one and I add one to it, I know that number is going to equal to two because... I've just done it so many times. I've been doing it since I was like one year old or whatever. So one plus one is two. Things become like that over time. Things become like that to you. But when you're first learning, the best thing you can do for yourself is to verify assumptions. I assume that if number equals 24, nothing's going to happen. Let me verify that that's true. And that's how you're going to get better.
there's another companion to if it is called else. So number equals 42, you're saying if the number is 24, do this thing. Else, do this thing. That's how you're going to read this code. And when I say this, hopefully it makes sense to you because it's saying, imagine if I was talking to you and I said, um, I said, imagine number was just age, age instead. So I said, how old are you? You said 42. I might say, if your age is 24, puts hello world, else, or as you can imagine, otherwise, otherwise puts not hello world. I'm gonna run it and it's gonna output not hello world. Okay. Whew. We did a lot. We did booleans, did numbers, did arrays, hashes, uh, strings, and now we did conditionals. So I'm gonna spend a brief period here talking about what your assignment is from today to tomorrow. And then I'm going to sit here and answer questions from the questions Q and A function until there are none left. Uh, the shortcut for, for running selected code is control option N, at least that's what it is on, uh, on my computer. And if you wanna check on your computer, you can just see it right over here. That'll describe. Normally this little caret symbol means control. This crazy symbol that only shows up on Max is the option key. And then N, this letter N. Um, if you have questions, uh, please just drop them in the chat so that they don't get lost because I know there's a lot of stuff flying past. Okay, uh, so to go over the homework, this is what we're gonna do. There's gonna be exercise one. Exercise one, you are going to create a variable which holds a string for the name of your best friend. I want you to make the name of your best friend be, I'm gonna turn the lights on, hold on, because I look creepy. Okay, I still look creepy, but now I look light, light and creepy. So exercise one, create a variable which holds a string for the name of your best friend. I want you to make the string all lowercase. So if your best friend's name is John, it should be lowercase j-o-h-n. I want you to output the length of their name. I want you to output their name reversed. And I want you to output their name with only the first letter capitalized. Um, and when you do that, think about ranges. Think about how you might do that. So. The easiest way to do that is to use the capitalize method that I showed before. I particularly do not want you to use the capitalize method. I want you to think about how to use things that you've learned, including ranges, to ranges and accessing parts of something to make your own capitalized version of that name. Then kind of for exploration, if you have more time, I'd like you to go look at the Ruby documentation page for string uh, or for integer hash array, whatever you'd like. Uh, and what other methods do you see here? What can you make out of them? In exercise two, I want you to create a variable which holds a hash of a few names and ages, meaning the key would be the name and the value would be the age. I want you to create a variable which holds the name of one of the people from the hash. And then I wanna output a complete sentence that says, the name and age of the person that you selected, meaning the name that's in the variable, um, using hash lookup. So you'll output something like um, John is 34 years old. Uh, and when you're done with that, I want you to figure out how to edit, commit it, and push it to GitHub. So the hope here is that your repository is going to end up with a file called main.rb that does these two things. You can comment them to keep them separate from each other. And then I want it pushed to your repository. I'm not gonna check your repository. Like I said yesterday, I can't because there's, let me put in here. Uh, there's 172 people uh, in here and there are a bunch that have not a, that, that can't be here in person right now um, for whatever reason, if they have a, a busy night or something. So I can't check your all of your submissions. If you have questions about your submission or you want me to look at it, you can, you can feel free to message me on Slack or email me, but um, just by like, um, 
it's on you. Like I said yesterday, you have to do these exercises. Uh, if you think that you're going to skip them and still things are going to be okay, um, I respectfully disagree. You need to do the exercises. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, first extend, extend my parking so I don't get a ticket. And then I'm going to sit here and answer these questions uh, until there are no more questions. And I will, um, you know, I'll be here. Okay, so I'm going to start at the. I'm going to turn off the exercise, but I will. I'll. I'll post this exercise. Um, I'll include it in the email that I send out later. Um, it, the the assignments written up in the, in this, which I'll send out later. Okay. There's a couple of questions at the top here from before. I'm going to answer them, uh, but I'm going to. I'll just do them all in order. Okay. So how have your roles in the tech industry exposed you to the legal side of things? Um, looking, uh, starting law school this year and have an interest in intellectual property law. Um, yeah, there are, there's a, like a whole career um, arc for lawyers that are intellectual property lawyers or are tech lawyers. We hired a lot of them at GitHub. Um, it's a totally valid career. Um, I think that's one thing that's really interesting about programming, especially in recent years, is that um, things like GDPR compliance have increasingly made programmers have to be more aware of laws. So just something to mention. Uh, fellow Badger here, I'm guessing this is for Mary. Uh, I will pass that along though. What are the most versatile programming languages being used nowadays for performance as well as UI? Uh, I think probably the answer there would be something like Java, C++, um, because in UI in particular, um, there are only certain languages that can effectively do UI um, in a native way. So on Mac OS, you would have to use something like either C++ or Objective-C. Um, so I would say like any of those languages, if you're talking about web UI, then uh, JavaScript and CSS is the only option. I said, okay, to use the terminal for git add, git commit, git push. Uh, sure, yeah, you can. On code spaces, you can use the terminal the same way that you can use all the other functionality. It's just the computer. So you can do whatever you want. Um, could you explain why Ruby has lost popularity in recent years? I have spent about a year learning it, and it seems like a lot of tutorials and guides are quite old. Um, I think Ruby over time has gone like in waves up and down. I don't think that the popularity of a programming language is the reason that someone should pick one over another. So um, yeah, I, I can't speculate on why it's lost popularity. I think things like Go um, are super interesting, but they are it's a different programming language with like a different mindset and different um, different everything. So um, if you're interested in it, I encourage you to check it out. Go is very cool. Uh, what do I work on Ruby day to day? Um, yeah, I code. I do a lot of uh, problem solving. I do a lot of architecture. So I talk to a lot of people about how they might build something. Um, and so that's kind of as a virtue of my role as a staff engineer. Um, it wasn't always like that, but I find that my days are like, some of them are meeting heavy, some of them are code heavy. It, it kind of goes back and forth. How important is it, it is to be proficient in data structures and algorithms to get a role as a developer? Uh, not important unless you're applying for a role that requires data structures and algorithms. So if you think you're gonna run into like a, a backend role, like developing some kind of very complex database software or something, you'll need it there, but otherwise, no. Where are the recordings available? The recordings are available. Um, I send them out via email, and then um, I don't have any kind of directory of them. So you just have to search through your email. Uh, at the end of the course, I'm planning on trying to make them available publicly as long as everything goes OK. Uh, OK, next question. Why are we not putting two greater than signs like, OK, this is this is going to be good because we're about to jump into questions about the code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reshare my editor so that I can um, that I can talk about it and type about it at the same time. OK, so why are we not putting two greater than signs like equals to? Yeah. So the question is, why are we not doing something like uh, if we did age equals equals 42, why are we not doing age greater than greater 42? And the reason for that is because 
the only reason that there are two equal signs is to separate age equals equals 42 from age equals 42. So we don't do the same thing for greater than comparison because um, there is no need to separate it from something else. Um, and then anyone that's really into programming uh, and knows Ruby very well will know that there are, there's more to be said there. I'm going to not say those things because I think they're confusing. But the idea is that um, the greater than symbol is what you put for it greater than. It is the thing that's important for greater than. So this is an equals comparison. This is a greater than comparison. That's how they work. Um, and like someone said in the chat, this is for assignment. This is for equality. So they're just different. You just have to remember them. Um, and they're actually the same in pretty much every programming language. So you learn them here uh, and you'll learn them everywhere. Uh, can we run just a single line of code? Yeah, you can. At the, uh, in the first, in the first uh, session of the course, we did puts hello world. That's a single line of code. Okay, what is the dot for? So we're going to learn this in two days. We're going to learn in, in very, very sufficient depth what the dot is for. But what the dot is for, you can think of it as call. So what call means is I want to puts age and call its odd method. So you can think of the same way I was saying before, where there's there's a box somewhere, right? And that box has something like integer inside of it. Okay, this is the type integer, which is defined by you can see here the type integer, and inside of that type integer there are all these little sub boxes. Um, these sub boxes are called methods. So one of those methods is called odd, and one of those methods is called even. So when I'm calling age.odd, I'm saying call the odd method from the sub box integer because age is an integer. I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't in two days, it's going to make sense because in two days, we're going to talk about classes, which is what these are actually called. The space covered a letter like it said 11. Um, I'm not sure what that question is. I'm going to dismiss the question, but if you have the question still, please ask it again. Uh, Carmen uh, says, is less than less than like a pipe or does it only work for string variables and not functions? Well, it uh, works for string variables, it works for array variables, and it actually can work for any type, which we'll learn in a couple of days that when we get into methods that Less than less than is just another method. So the same way that a method can be called odd, there can be a method called less than less than. And if you don't understand the def end, don't worry about it because we're going to talk about it soon. Um, That's a very particular question. I just wanted to make sure I answered it. Um, how do we get the app? Do we have to download it or what? Um, if you're talking about the Code Spaces app that I'm using here, watch session one. That's going to show you how to get set up. Um, and follow your emails um, if you uh, if you need to get access to it. There's actually an, a beta program that you need to be part of. Um, the next question is, does less than less than work with hashes? It does not. And the reason it does not, and okay, so a couple of things. First, the way you can find out is you can go to this here and you can see less than less than is defined on string. Less than less than is defined on array. But if I go to hash, uh, there is no less than less than. The reason it doesn't work is because um, you got to think about like what would it mean, right? You have a hash, which is a mapping of key to value. So what would it mean to put something into a hash? It doesn't mean anything because you can't put two things into the hash. The way you actually put something into a hash or append to it is like this, key equals value. Are you gonna send us the exercise file? Yes, I'll include the exercise detail in the email that I send after the course. Can you go over setting the syntax or setting the syntax one more time? I didn't see where you brought up the bar to search. Uh, yeah, so oh, you're talking about this. So you click down at the bottom, click the name of the language. Uh, normally it will auto detect based on the file extension, but if you've somehow changed that, you can just type the name of the language and hit enter and it'll fix it. 
Uh, could you send the Dropbox link? Yes, I'll include the Dropbox link in the um, in the email. What do you mean we have to capitalize the first letter using the? Yeah, um, I want you to capitalize the first letter of the word, but not use um, to not use the capitalized method to do that because that'd be too easy. <laughs> you know, like you can start there, um, but I want you to um, to use the other things that I taught you to figure out how to do that. Next question: Will it be only questions afterward? Because I want to go to sleep. Please, please go to sleep. Next question, I have a question regarding my CV. I have a big gap on it. Is that a problem? Like almost nine years? I think it's totally fine. Uh, I would put something if I were you to explain the gap. So um, put something in to explain why that gap is there. Gaps can be concerning if they're not explained. So uh, for example, if, if I see a resume and it says something like mother, that's, that's fine. It's okay. Um, it's okay to have gaps. Uh, what are we supposed to name the file for the exercise? Um, also, we're not using the reverse function, have to make our own reverse code. I No, do not make your own reverse code. We're not there yet. Um, obviously, you'll be there in the next couple of days, but it's just jumping too far ahead. Just use the reverse method. Um, are there any variable format in Ruby underscore or camel case? There is not any particular variable format in Ruby. It has to start with a lowercase letter. Um, it can contain underscores, it can use camel cases. The most common Ruby casing is snake case. And what that means is that when you have a variable and it is multiple words, um, you would say something like letter of the alphabet. Um, this is snake case, you use underscores to separate words. This is how you write variables in Ruby. Um, the reason I don't teach that, a lot of programming courses teach things like this. I think it's not important but even more than that, I think that it's something that you're gonna pick up from watching how I code. Meaning you're not gonna have room to write it the wrong way because I'm not gonna write it the wrong way. So I hope that makes sense. I, I, I don't want to waste time on like minutia. Um, I wanna get people coding. Is the webinar recorded? I got time zone issues. The webinar is recorded, but if you can be here in person, that's um, that's super appreciated because um, I want you to be able to ask questions and participate in the course and not spend a lot of time trying to get caught up. How do you go from being an intermediate developer to someone building CRUD apps and working on small features to becoming an advanced developer? Get a job as a junior developer, work hard, get bigger and bigger features under your belt, bigger and bigger projects, then you eventually start leaving projects then you'll eventually be making architectures. Just kind of happens as a progression as you go. Uh, where's the code app available? Uh, this app is called Code Spaces. It's available through a registration link that should be in your email. Again, just very quickly, can you go over the programming languages that we'll be exploring? We're talking about uh, Ruby, Rails, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, SQL. Um, you can find all that information and more in the first session. Uh, next question, I observed we did not use semicolons here in Ruby. Uh, yeah, uh, Ruby supports semicolons, but you don't use them. There's no, there's no point to use them. Um, if you have two statements and you wanna put them on the same line, you can technically separate them with a semicolon. It's just bad form, don't ever do that. And if I catch you doing it, I'm gonna do this. Um, in hashes, do keys have to be unique? Yeah, they do. That's a really good point. Um, so if you do hash key equals value, the second one here uh, overrides the previous line. So uh, hashes are unique, in, or sorry, hash keys are unique in a hash. Um, and that is not true for arrays. Arrays can contain multiple of the same element, it's fine. Uh, can we change a letter in a string by doing something like string of two equals X? Absolutely you can. How do you know the number of spaces to keep in between statements or methods or even spaces to keep in between codes? Um, I think it's something you're gonna learn over time as you kind of watch uh, me write code and you start coding like the way that I'm writing the code. Um, the space between methods is typically one uh, in the space around here. It really, it doesn't matter. It's more just about writing code that, that looks nice. 
Um, so this, for example, doesn't look super nice, but this does. Um, a lot of people write them like this. That's okay. Um, you'll pick up more of it as we go, I think. Uh, in today's task, it says to output the name and the age of the person we selected. Does that mean, for example, we have a key for John and a name and a key for John's age? Um, yes, you're going to have a variable for John. Sorry, variable for John that represents John. And then you're going to have a variable that represents a hash of John to age. Uh, thanks a lot, John. Uh, yeah, Yashio, I hope I say, say your name correctly. Um, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, how do you get code space? If you're logged into GitHub, you have to complete the registration link, and then I have to manually type your name into GitHub. So please complete the registration link. Uh, it's in yesterday's email, and I'll get your I'll get you set up. How do you voice recognition to type code? Uh, no, I don't do that. That's a cool idea. Um, I think I would if like one of my woodworking machines chopped my hands off, I would probably do it. But I I like to type. Um, John, I really appreciate your time. I'm assuming you have to get some dinner. <laughs> I like dinner. Um, I appreciate your concern. I'm going to go home right after this. Well, I'm going to upload the recording, then I'm going to go home. Um, you can look into apprenticeship programs. Yeah, apprenticeship programs, Andrea, are great. Um, I, re I recommend them for a lot of people. So that's another path from junior developer. You can also look at like internships. I'm a little confused on the assignment and exercise to create a variable that holds a hash of a few names and ages. So the keys are the person's name and the value is their age. That is correct. Um, how about using a colon and a hash key pair? That is actually something different. Uh, we will be covering that in the course. Um, it is a little bit confusing because while that will work and it's going to work exactly the same, it actually um, can mean something different depending on how you, how you write it. And I don't want to confuse people. So I'm not going to teach that until later. It's actually on my list for tomorrow. Uh, what's the blue line that you have in your code? I believe that's the editor telling me that those things are not checked into version control. So that's why the blue little circle over here, and that's why the blue line. Um, is this an acceptable way to write hashes? Uh, that is an acceptable way to write hashes. I imagine that you are trying to talk about the trailing comma. Um, yes, you can do that. I don't write code like that. You can do whatever you want. Um, that will work though. Um, file automatically save. It'll automatically save, but it won't automatically go to GitHub. If you don't know how to get it to GitHub, I covered it in the beginning of the class um, today. So go back to the beginning of the class and rewatch the video. Uh, thanks, John. That really helps anytime. Um, I hope the person, by the way, that had was like, here are, here's where you lose me when I started talking about hashes. I hope that um, the whimsical drawing that I was making was helping. Um, after this course, is it advisable to only apply to junior developer positions? Hey, you know, get any job you can. Junior developer, regular developer, senior developer. Um, I think that I will prepare you to apply somewhere as a junior developer. What's your advice to aspiring product managers? Uh, this was a question for Mary. Um, my advice to aspiring product managers is um, if you have a career gap and you are in this boot camp and you want to become a product manager, I think a lot of times programming can be like a skill that helps you be a better product manager. Um, you can use it to make little prototypes or you can make it um, things without having engineering people around. That's the way that I would use programming as a product manager. I think it's very relevant. Next question, if the empty hash is called hash, what is, <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny question. I don't know if it's a, um, I don't know if, uh, so what they're, what they're saying is like, okay, you're calling this thing hash. Um, and by that, by that, I mean that uh, you're calling this thing hash. And like, what is this symbol called? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's called, it's called hash. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I never thought about that before, but uh, uh, this I would refer to as a comment. Um, so I, I think you'll practically never have a reason to have to say this line. Uh, because you don't have to ever say comments out loud. So when I talk about hash, I'm talking about this hash every single time. Uh, yeah, you can say pound sign. That's another way to say it. I think that's used typically for telephones, but that's that's a perfectly fine way to say it. Can you set the syntax to Ruby one more time while I have the editor open? Yep, click Ruby, and then type in Ruby, hit enter. 
how would you approach learning during this bootcamp as someone aspiring for a product background? Um, I would say just do the bootcamp like everybody else and then see how you can apply it afterward. So see how it is most relevant to your, um, your approach to things. Um, so I would say like use it to try to build something, see how it goes and, um, and take it from there. So I think like in general, I would try to not approach the class um, with an expectation of what you're going to do or what you're going to get. I know people are asking about like Python versus Ruby, for example. Um, I, my opinion is that it's not as important as just doing something. You're going to do something. You're going to learn to code. We're going to make an app together over the next um, 14 remaining days. And uh, then at the end, you figure out what that means for you and your career. Maybe it means that you're going to keep your job and you're going to use it coding to make your job better or easier, or maybe it means you're gonna be a, a developer, uh, or maybe it means you're gonna be in support. It doesn't matter. I don't care why you're here. Uh, what I care about is that we're gonna teach you to code. So I hope this has been a helpful session too. Um, I have no more questions, so I am going to get out of here. I'm gonna upload this right now, and I'm gonna send around uh, a mailer with all of the different pieces um, that I talked about. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to answer one more question because it just came up. Um, it's fine, Eric. It's fine. Um, and thank you, Erica. That's very nice. Uh, how often do you use hash tables in the workplace? Uh, I took data structure, structures and algorithms in school, but we skipped over it. Um, every single day. Absolutely. Every single day. It is a required, uh, it is a required type in modern programming languages um, to, use, to use hash tables. So... Um, we're going to use them extensively. Any Ruby developer will use them every single day. Um, and I wouldn't think of them as like a DSNA type thing. They're, um, they're a necessary part of programming. Um, I was a developer, but at this point, how can I get my resume to stand out after a long break? Uh, do this course, get some practical experience, get some code out there that other people can see, and um, that'll help your resume speak for itself. Okay, have a good night, everyone. Uh, hash table is a hash. Hash table is just a hash. So just another word for dictionary map, et cetera. Thank you, Alexis. I appreciate that.